I started thinking about it towards the end of the last touring cycle. After sitting with a record for a while and and playing it live and seeing what uh, the reaction is with people, it sort of uh, alters your perspective on it a little bit, and you maybe start to hear things or see things or think about things that maybe you didn't while you were making it. So um, I, I wanted to approach a new record with all of that that stuff in mind and, and be a little bit more objective about this subjective art that I'm that I'm making. As he sits on the precipice of a new era, Dallin Weeks is anything but gloomy. Having built up a devoted cult following for his once secret musical project, I Don't Know How But They Found Me, he now invites that same audience to take a left turn and join him on a musical tour through the smooth soundscapes and off-kilter influences of their sophomore album, the often surprising and always eclectic Gloom Division. With a refreshed outlook and better understanding of his own creative process, Dallin guides us through the many twists and turns behind the long-awaited return of IDK Howe. You can read the full interview feature and pick up your exclusive copy of the album right now over at rocksound.tv. And here now with some video highlights from that conversation, I'm James Wilson-Taylor and this is the Rock Sound album story of Gloom Division by I Don't Know How But They Found Me. I feel like you've worn your influences on your sleeve a lot you know we talked about sparks and stuff before and there's yeah. clearly a bit of 80s feel in places on the last record this one what what was interesting that kind of seeps through for me is that yeah some of those influences are present and correct here i got a lot of 70s vibes man i don't know what you were listening to when you were making this but like there's some elvis costello hints in here there's a little bit of like swaggery glam rocky moments on something like satanic panic and stuff like it's it's really interesting to hear that kind of broadening of it's still it's still in that intentionally retro space but you're playing in different eras to me am i correct in saying that like what were the kind of other influences in here no it's it's good to hear you say those uh those those are buzzwords for me uh right. when when the last record came out I, I kept hearing 80s all the time which you know nothing against that particular era but i i don't i hadn't thought that i was really living in that space when i was making Rasmus because uh, music from the 70s, all that stuff that you're talking about was much more uh, of an influence to me while I was making this stuff. But, uh, you know, things sort of creep in organically. And uh, like I said, at the end of Resmataz, I, I thought that maybe it was this, but uh, other people kind of viewed it as this other thing. And so uh, with the, the new music, I, I wanted to take more of an intentional step towards the the things that I like. Uh, those things that you're talking about. Um, Sparks and Elvis Costello and um, also, also a little bit more of music that I was listening to when I was a teenager and in my early 20s because, you know, the, the process was reminding me of that uh, point in my life. So it kind of uh, psychologically took me back to to where I was and what I was listening to then. So it was it was things like, uh, you know, late 90s and early 2000s, I was listening to stuff like Ben Folds 5 and Phantom Planets and The White Stripes and, uh, you, you know, Louis XIV and, and stuff like that. So, um, so, the, so bands like that from that era also kind of put their foot in the door, along with this other stuff that I like from well, really loved from, uh, you know, the 70s. And it's interesting you say like all the stuff you listened to in the 90s and the early 2000s, which I very much relate to as well. I remember when you guys did the cover of um, Deborah by Beck. Yeah. I mean, the first single we've got to talk about here, you know, What Love. That's, I mean, Midnight Vultures is seeping into there a little bit in the best possible way. And I love that that's the first single as well, because it's, I think it's going to take the audience by surprise in a really nice way. It's it's a little more mellow. It's got a little more groove to it, but it's a very appropriate sound for the rest of the record. I think it's going to really take people by surprise in a good way. Tell me a little bit about where that track in particular came from, I guess. And was it always the obvious choice as being, now this has to be the first single out the gate? It was obvious for me because during the process of making the record, especially when, it, uh, when the recording process was finished and we were um, uh, mixing it, 
uh, in between that time, there was probably about a, a month where I'd left the studio, I'd come home and I was listening to the stuff and making notes for mixing. And uh, that song, What Love, was the one that kept popping up into my head. And and I kind of had to fight for it to, to be the single because there are uh, other songs on the, on the record that um, people on the team were really pushing for. But uh, to me, there was something about that song that would not leave my brain. And uh, I thought that maybe there's a reason for that. Uh, all of my favorite records, all of my favorite songs that I've ever heard the first time that I ever listened to them, uh, the reaction is, is always the same. And it always happens in steps. The first time I hear it, I'm like, what is that? And then you listen to it a second time and you go, this is weird, but I like this. And then by the third time you hear it, you're like, this is my new favorite thing. And that's been the case with all of my favorite stuff. Um, you know, this year's model, I, I heard for the first time when I was 22, and that was the reaction. The first time I heard the Ramones, or the first time I heard um, uh, Weezer's Pinkerton, or anything like that. What is this? It was always the first reaction. And I feel like that's the reaction with a song like What Love. Uh, it definitely fits in there with uh, the rest of the record, but it's, for me, it was the one that seems like it would be the the one that would most garner that reaction from people. So yeah. I'm hoping that that's what it does. Oh, I think so. Again, it's a nice stepping stone because I think a song like Infatuation as well definitely fits that mood. And it's, yeah, that's it's, actually my favorite song from the yeah. record, Infatuation. To me, that song is like um, uh, Hall and Oates join a cult on a, a yacht that's led by Michael McDonald. And uh, I just, I'm, I'm in love with that one. That's my favorite song. So I hope that that one gets a, a proper release out into the world as well. We started this conversation, we were talking about the fact that you were able to reach out to friends just to get their input or even just opinions on stuff. So yes, yeah. it is very much your solo project here, but that's no reason why it can't still be it doesn't have to be lonely, I suppose, is the way no, it is. You're it. absolutely right. And that's that's uh, kind of the ironic bit about this whole record is that uh, it is probably the most collaborative I've been since I was a teenager. Any any time before this record and well, the time in between now and when I was a teenager, it, it was very insulated. And I was being very guarded about it all. And uh, that that changed. I think this time, um, just just by taking a chance and, and reaching out to people whose work I admired and who it, you know you're, you're casually friends with, mm -hmm. you've maybe spoken to them on the internet once or twice. Or you, I mean, yeah, I mean, let's let's name some people. names. Let's name some names because I've, oh, I've, sure, I've, sure, I've yeah. seen some there's some of the um, people you're working with. But yeah, do tell. Uh, there's a, a band called Miniature Tigers that I've been um, casual acquaintances with for a long time. I would say friends by now, but um, Charlie Brand and Rick Alvin, uh, that's a fantastic band that I've been a fan of, fan of for years and years and years. And I each individually sent them both some ideas and and uh, they, they came back and, and it was very, very natural, very organic. Nothing was, nothing was ever forced. And that was so fun uh, that I decided to try that again and it, it kept happening and it kept working or just like uh will joseph cook from the uk who's fantastic um i've done some shows with him and he's a, a lovely gentleman and a talented artist so I did some collaborating with him and um uh, a man named jason hill from louis the 14th who i mentioned before uh i was such a fan of his for and, and still am of course uh such a fan of that band there is one song in particular where I purposefully wanted to to be a little more uh, bright and shiny, the uh, Sunny Side song that I, I wrote with uh, Will Joseph Cook. He's got a, a wonderful knack for writing songs that are very upbeat and happy sounding, which is why I wanted to collaborate with him and uh, on that one. Also, oh, also, I can't fail to mention that that song was also worked on by uh, someone that the algorithm sent me on TikTok. This this kid who lives in New Jersey, um, his name is Noah Bobrow. And 
He's like maybe 19, 20 years old. And uh, yeah, the algorithm sent me this kid's TikTok page. He only had like a dozen or so TikToks of him playing this like uh, bossa nova samba type music on these little Casio keyboards that he would either manipulate or take apart or send through tape machines. And he's, he's just doing it for, you know, himself. And that comes across very clearly. And I was so fascinated with this kid's like little 30 second pieces that he was doing. So I emailed him and said, like, everything you're doing on this TikTok page is incredible. Do you want to write a song? And he was like, yeah, man. So we wrote this song and I send it to uh, Will Joseph Cook too, because he has this wonderful perspective on, on songs that have like this positive sounding uh, aspects to them. So the, the three of us together ended up writing a, a, at least one song on the record that uh, is a little more bright and shiny, hence the title Sunny Side. Something like Gloomtown Brats is really interesting to me because it's, again, it's that, it's that sort of like social satire thing like that we kind of heard a bit with Do It All The Time in the past, that sort of like, you seem to enjoy that a lot, I think, in a lot of your lyric writing, that kind of, let's look at look outwardly at some of these yeah, kinds. classism and sort of uh, wealthy privilege and other other types of privilege that exist in the world. Uh, pretty privilege and white privilege. Uh, you know, this stuff didn't really have a name for me until Twitter came around and I started being exposed to this uh, this different point of view on the the culture that I grew up with. Uh, I I grew up without money um as a, as a lot of us do and uh one of my favorite quotes growing up especially when it came to uh the chasing music as a dream and as a career uh i have no idea if he actually said this but uh, there's a, an american baseball player named yogi berra who's very famous for these quotes and so so much so that you don't really know if he even said this but it got attributed to him. And the quote was, rich boys never make it to the majors. And uh, I always took that and applied it to the music. You know, I, I had a, a guitar from a pawn shop and a second hand amplifier. And every single show that I would play, everything had to be duct tape and super glued together in order to just get through it. And in between shows, I was, uh, um, cleaning carpets or, or doing construction. And, uh, so, so if you're chasing music, uh, it's, it's not a nine to five, it's 24 seven. So on top of that 24 seven pursuit, I was also doing the nine to five jobs and that's just what you have to do. And some jobs that I had to do were, uh, I still have nightmares about because they were so God awful. Um, but uh, but yeah, having having ha having tried to pursue that as a career, while you see other people that do have money and do have the support of wealthy parents who buy them all the gear and buy them the uh, opening spot on this or that show, it's a, it's hard to deal with. But at the same time, you know that's the world that we live in, and there's n really nothing you can do about it other than try to work hard and not give up. But, uh, you know, sometimes you, you end up writing about that. That's that sort of little, little bit of resentment towards not having the, the, the these things that the people who do have uh, take for granted. Because there certainly are, you know, rich kids who grow up and are aware of what they have and aware of their position, aware of their privilege and, and they treat it appropriately. But there's also people who are totally oblivious to it. And that's sort of uh, a theme that I've, I've written about once or twice. Yeah. Um, it's funny. I, well. I, th I think if, if you are in that position, uh, the best thing that you can do is, is uh, treat it appropriately and um, help others where you can, um, altruism and all that stuff. So those people do exist in the world, but uh, oh, yeah. 
we we tend to write about those that aren't aware <laughs> well it's, not, it's i mean it's it's you know it's 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 satirical as well isn't it it's pointed there's gags in those lyrics you know what i mean there's a set there's a sense of humor to it there has to be a bit of a barbed dry kind of a british sense of humor to it really yeah and i well. think i think that's a, it's it's i'm very influenced by by your people and uh, <laughs> uh sparks tend to do that a lot as well so i, I think that um i've got an appreciation for the the, the tongue-in-cheek stuff. Elvis Costello is another great example of that. It's also interesting, I want to mention as well on the lyric front, uh, Speak the Devil, because, I mean, a couple of lyrics I noted down here, but your front page boy is finally here, uh, turn it off because it doesn't sound like them. This sounds to me a little bit like some of the things we talked about before, but aspects of fame that maybe don't sit that well, maybe some of the aspects of, I don't know, expectation versus reality a little bit. Tell me a little bit about where that one kind of came from. Uh, well, you just nailed it. That's the theme of the song, expectation versus reality. Uh, um, particularly whenever a, a, a band that you like puts out a new record, and, you know, if they decide to um, take a step in a new direction or, or evolve a little bit musically, that can sometimes be disconcerting to a fan because there's this thing that you love and it's it's this and you've defined it and you put it into this box and and that's what it is but the thing inside the box wants to peek out and it wants to you know put its shoes on and walk around a little bit and try something new and that can be a little bit uh, a, a little bit challenging maybe for people but um, that's what that line is you know turn the record off because it doesn't sound like them well why do you get to say what they sound like you know you you don't <laughs> and I've, I've always wanted to be the kind of artist that, that writes whatever kind of song i want to if i want to make a country song I'll, I'll do it you know if i want to make whatever kind of song i i want to like it first and foremost you know you know i want to make this for me and if anybody else out in the world happens to like it that's just an incredible bonus that you get to enjoy it want to mention the title of course and the artwork as well which i got to see today so i mean gloom division is an interesting title obviously we've got gloom town brats in there as well which i imagine ties slightly in but also taught me through that artwork that's a beautiful piece of artwork man i gotta say a lot of Thank kind you. of tim burton-esque vibes in there as well it's very very interesting um tell me who you're working with on the artwork as well uh well the album artwork uh came together i i, I was looking for like a looking through like a brutalist uh, architecture and photography. Um, I had become really fascinated with that. And I, I found that the algorithm sent me this photographer whose speciality is photographing buildings uh, that are made in that style. And they, they had this really wonderful photo of, of two orange painted walls that intersect with each other against the background of a blue sky. And I thought this that's a really great picture i i would love to to use that so I, I reached out to the photographer and got to talking about what i wanted to to do with it and they were really enthusiastic about the idea um so yeah i just sort of in, inserted myself sitting on the, the wall of this photo that they had taken and uh the the title uh, both gloomtown brats and gloom division are sort of you know uh callbacks to things that exist already uh the boomtown rats you know who made that song I, I don't like mondays and amongst many other things that's the thing that people will go to is knowing boomtown rats so forgive me mr geldof for <laughs> listing only that but um uh gloom division i wanted to call the the album just gloom originally but then uh joe carey also known as joe with a d DJO, uh, he had come out with his own album called Gloom. And so uh, <laughs> this was, I, I don't remember when he came out with his album, but when he did come out with his record, uh, mine had already been recorded and mixed and conceptualized and everything. And I was ready to go with this album title. And he came out with his and I was like, God damn it, Joe Carey. <laughs> Uh, so I just decided to go, well, you know, Gloomtown Brats, Boomtown Rats, Joy Division, Gloom Division. So uh, just tacked on Division to the end of it. I'm, 
I thought, yeah, yeah I, I actually like that better. So I, I didn't want to step on Mr. Carey's toes, and I don't want to offend anyone from the the, the Joy Division New Order camp, of course. Uh, and any sort of callbacks to that stuff, it's done from a place of love and admiration. So I, I hope that that comes across. But um, okay. uh, the inside of, of the album, uh, the Tim Burton part that you're talking about, that shows uh, six figures that are sort of clad in black and have this black goo coming from out of them and if uh, if all goes according to plan the, the album cover will change with the qr code and the suit that i'm wearing will turn black as well the sky will turn gray so i'm hoping that happens by the time this comes out but uh, the idea is that the six people on the inside of that album cover represent six of the seven deadly sins and then I become the seventh one. Um, so yeah, without being too specific as to who is who, I'm, I think I'll let fans pick that out. I guess in the immediate future, we should talk about things like live plans. Uh, I mean, I know the last time I saw you guys in the UK, you're already beginning to expand that, that live setup. Um, yeah. I imagine it's, it's obviously gonna look a bit different this time. Are you thinking about expanded that even further i mean this this record if if anything you've done so far this very much lends itself to the idea of having all manner of different things going on on stage if you can well yeah that's always been the goal um from the time that i started making the first idk hail songs in a, in a studio by myself uh, i'd always imagined a, a full band on stage and when it got started as a, a two-piece that was just out of necessity because i didn't have any money and um you know couldn't couldn't pay a a bunch of musicians to come and and join me to 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 do this secret project so everything from that to the band name itself was was born out of necessity you know trying to keep it inexpensive and easy to do at the drop of a hat oh i've got a free weekend i'm gonna go anonymously book a show at some dive bar um so keeping it a, a two-piece for as long as i did was a uh, that that was born out of necessity to to be able to just to get it started and go do it but as uh, as things have grown uh, we've been able to have other people join us on stage a wonderful gentleman anthony Prepura, who's been playing guitar for the band for a while now he's he's going to come back and and uh yeah i i want to find eventually you know if dreams come true i'll have a horn section and you know, a string section and this and that and all, you know, that, and that's in a perfect world if, uh, if uh, wallets become opened and, you know, <laughs> things like that. Mon money is always a, a factor, unfortunately. But uh, yeah, it, it'll, it'll look, uh, ideally, it, there'll, there'll be at least uh, two, two more additional players up on stage with me doing this stuff. Have you still been writing? Have you still been thinking yeah. about other stuff? Wow. Yeah, I, I've got about uh, two more albums worth of stuff wow. uh, built up. Well, don't do not do that because it's not all good. <laughs> <laughs> it's still impressive. It's still an impressive yeah, amount. So of, of, of that amount of ideas that I've been toying with, uh, um, it, the, the three or four of them I like. You know, That's not to say that the rest couldn't develop into something that I like, uh, but I haven't stopped working. So hopefully it, it won't be this same amount of time in between a, uh, this release and whatever comes next. So. 